I will turn on my video. Here I am. Hi, everyone. And um, let's get started. So thanks for tuning in today for the Atlanta Economics Club webinar. I'd like to kick off our event by first acknowledging the unprecedented times. Little did we know when we closed out our last season back in May that we'd still be in the midst of this, I'll call it this, and converting our complete 2020 to 2021 season um, to virtual programming. For our regular attendees, welcome back. Um, we've missed you. Um, I missed the opportunity to network with you all face-to-face -face before the program kicks off. Um, I hope you're all hanging in there and doing well in the face of these challenging times. For those who are joining us for the first time, welcome to the Atlanta Economics Club. We're really glad to have you with us. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to make a few announcements. So the first is programming committee related. In past seasons, we've aimed to have our complete program fleshed out and posted um, by our first meeting of the season, which is right now. Um, if you guys visited our website, um, you'll notice that we, we have Ken's posted and, and that's about it. We've been, we've been actively working on our program. Um, a lot is underway. We have a little bit more flexibility this season because as, as you've noted, if you are on our mailing list and have received our newsletter, we've decided to put our individual memberships on pause this season. We're not accepting individual memberships. Um, thanks to generous support from our corporate members, our board has um, gone ahead and invested in this platform and has decided to make all of our programming this season. Season um, free and available to all, whether you're a member or not member. So that's, that's what's happening there in case you've tried to go in and, and renew. We appreciate um, your loyalty to us, but that's where our decision lies. Excuse me. Um, also, I would like to provide a student engagement update, developing the pipeline through a few ways. One is complimentary membership to, to our Atlanta Economic Club programming. The 2020 scholarship application has been posted on our website. It's open for submissions. And so if you know anyone, please, please share that this scholarship application is out there. It's for undergraduate and graduate students. The application deadline is November 1st, and so please help us get the word out. We'd love to have um, we'd love to have those applications start rolling in. And the second way that we um, support the development pipeline of, of, of students and future professionals is through organizing outreach activities specifically geared towards students. So on August 6th, we held a student engagement event led by our very own AEC board member, Jael Ortiz. Jael is a current, um, I guess she's a junior now, right? Right, Jael, at Georgia State, and she's also our student liaison on the board. She moderated a discussion with several of our board members on the realities of working remotely. Um, the session was recorded and it's been posted to our YouTube channel, and um, actually it's generated a fair amount of interest. Folks have emailed me after the event wanting to know how they can kind of check in. And so if you know of any students who are near completing their studies and on the cusp of entering the workforce, please encourage them to check out our recording. Um, there's some great tips and insights um, that were shared by our board members on um, at that event. And so I think that wraps up our announcements. Without further ado, let me introduce our guest speaker. We are very fortunate to have Kenneth Shiver here with us today. Kenneth serves as the chief economist, not the chief financial officer, and the director of planning and regulatory support for the Atlanta-based Southern Company. At Southern Company, his team monitors the economic environment, develops operational analytics, forecasts energy demand, and conducts cost-benefit studies that drive the company's planning and analysis processes. From this deep engagement on the demand side of the utility industry, he represents the company as a witness in its regulatory filings and engages with the industry on current issues related to electrification, electric transportation, pricing, energy efficiency, and utility planning. Currently, he's serving as a commissioner on the Alliance to Save Energy's 5050 Transportation Commission. He has over 25 years of experience in planning and analysis functions of Southern Company and has degrees from both University of West Georgia and Georgia State University. Ken's with us today to provide an update on the US and Georgia economy during the pandemic, and he's also go going to provide an overview of how COVID-19 has impacted the utility industry. Um, before I hand the mic to Ken, please um, know that on the Zoom webinar, there's a Q&A button at the bottom. I'd encourage you throughout the presentation 
to um, submit your questions as we go. At the very end, we've saved time and I'll, I'll moderate the Q&A and pose your questions to Ken, um, Kenneth. And so without further ado, I'd like to virtually pass the mic to you, Kenneth. Um, take, take it away. All right, thanks, Jessica. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay. I'm gonna mute myself and I'm also going to get your presentation live. All right, now trying to start video on my end, but evidently it, it doesn't wanna do that on my end, so uh, we're fine. Uh, nobody wants to see what I look like anyway, so. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> we all but, wanna uh, see you. But no, very glad to be here with you all today. Uh, a very interesting time. I. Uh, this is one of these things you have to take credit for when you can take credit for when you do forecasting work. So back in February, we did a little economic presentation to the Forsyth Chamber. And uh, at the very back of the presentation, uh, Daniel Buidrago and I put a little blur of, you know, things to watch for this year. We kind of said, you know, there's this funny little thing going on in China, this, this virus thing. Uh, but two months later, I got a call from the Forsyth Chamber saying, think she predicted the pandemic. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> We got lucky that we didn't even put it in there as a mention because none of us had an idea when all uh, we started maybe thinking about it in January and uh, February and all that we were going to be doing what we're doing right now and how much change and impact is going to be going on the economy. Uh, as some of y'all are familiar with Southern, um, Southern Company, we are an electric and gas utility. Uh, we serve about 9 million customers um, uh, in our gas and electric franchises. And one of the interesting things that um, I kind of try to bring forward, and we talk about the economy a little bit, you know, basically for the economy to function, you got to consume electricity, you got to consume energy. And so what we're under having, we were very, very interested in what's happening in the economy, but when we get times like this, actually looking at our electricity data gives us some really good insights onto where the economy is actually at and what's functioning in the economy or not functioning. And so I'm going to bring some of those insights for y'all today. But um, first thing I kind of wanted to start out with, and go ahead and flip to the first slide here, Jessica. Um, kind of framework. Uh, you know, as I think about as an economist, I love to kind of say, okay, here's my framework for thinking about this problem. Here's my framework for thinking about this one. And this is kind of the framework we've kind of been <clears throat> thinking about, especially as we start thinking about the speed and shape of the recovery. One is, is where are we at on controlling the virus and the spread of the virus? What's going on out there? If you look at some of the early optimistic projections, they were saying the virus would be completely under control. We're gonna have hot, sunny weather and the virus is gonna go away by the end of May and summer was gonna be pretty normal. We all kind of know that that's not quite happened. Um, the more baseline assumptions were assuming that we were gonna be dealing with this probably throughout the summer and then the question mark is, where do we go into the fall? Uh, the more pessimistic cases basically said we never get, can get control of it. Um, so we been sort of keeping a very close eye, where's the virus at? How are government policies responding to the virus and what is it doing to businesses? The second one we've been really thinking about as we think about our outlook has been what, where are we at with fiscal and monetary policy response? And this is one of the things where you just have to kind of go, okay, for the second quarter, we probably got as close to an A as you could ever say you can get from fiscal and monetary policy response. We basically stopped the economy and we basically passed the, the lar historically largest ever stimulus program in basically the month right after we declared the recession to beginning uh, in March. Um, and we've basically done everything we could do from a fiscal and monetary policy standpoint to help the economy collectively hold its breath for the second quarter. Now, that was second quarter. As we get into third quarter now, now we're starting to wring our hands and getting the political infighting, and we seem to be hung up a lot more on what are we going to do to help carry things going forward, and we're creating a lot of uncertainty. But, and this is one of the things, again, optimistic paths, paths were going to be very robust, quick, effective fiscal monetary policy. Um, the more pessimistic path basically got to ineffective fiscal and monetary policy. And right now we're somewhere in between. We'll talk more about that. The big last thing that I come to, and I'll spend some time on here at the end, is then how are consumers and businesses going to change in response to all this? I mean, you stop and think about it a minute. I mean, we're, 
very few of us have probably even have grandparents that remember the pandemic back in 1918. Probably have to go further back than that. We are living through something that is unprecedented in our collective history. And the longer it goes on, going back to item one here on our list, the more we are teaching people to do things differently, we are forcing businesses to find new ways to get work done. And all of a sudden we're learning things and they will probably, some of them will tend to stick around. One of the big things I always point to in recessions is things that were small trickles and streams prior to the recession, many times become large streams and raging rivers after the recession, because businesses are forced to look at those things they were just looking at, glancing at prior to all this. And so we'll spend some time here at the end focusing on that. But keep that framework in your mind as we talk through things. So let's do a little uh, ground setting here, go to the next slide. You know, the economist's favorite indicator, employment data. A couple things in this chart here, you have um, the blue line representing the change in total employment. Uh, the red bars representing which sectors have had the drop going from the beginning of the year till June. And basically what we see is, is we basically got rid of 20 million jobs in less than six months. Now we've added some back, but think about how big of an impact that has been. I mean, we had estimates of 40, 50, I think even saw 60% declines in second quarter GDP. We kept it to 32.9% contraction on an annualized basis in second quarter GDP. Um, but one of the things I will tell you to note here on this employment graph, because a lot of people were shocked, because everybody keeps trying to use the 2008-9 recession, the 2001 recession, as proxies for how we should think about this recession. This recession is really weird. It is a policy-driven recession, and historically, we've only had two of these. 1937, the, we felt like the economy was growing too fast in the middle of the Depression, and we changed policy, and we brought the economy back into a recession. In 1980, Paul Volcker said, hey, inflation's a problem. I'm going to raise interest rates to double digits and starve inflation out of the economy. Here, we basically said, okay, we don't want everybody to get sick. We don't know how to treat this thing. We're going to shut the economy down and try to get control of the virus. The big thing about policy-driven recessions is that many times they're occurring where there are not fundamental imbalances in the economy. Um, recessions are caused or are, are all about resolving imbalances in the economy. And you have to kind of go here, housing was pretty much imbalanced going into this. Man, in, industrial manufacturing was coming back in the first quarter. Where were the imbalances? There really weren't any. So basically, when you stop the economy from a policy standpoint, when you remove the policy restriction, you get a pretty good bounce back. The problem is, what damage did you do during the policy restriction? And that's what we're feeling our way through here now. And you can see by the red bars what industries have been impacted. Leisure and hospitality is a quarter of the job losses. Business and professional services, which is where a lot of the temporary workers are. They're also, I think, where your uh, haircuts are, which I keep telling folks, you know, during recessions, you kind of go, okay, we can only go so low because everybody's got to get a haircut. But in this recession, we're kind of going, <laughs> nobody's getting a haircut. So if you haven't gotten your haircut yet, go get one. Um, retail trade. You go back to 2008-9, the leading indicators down here were construction employment, manufacturing employment. Um, this is another unique thing about all this, as we all know probably here on this call, it's a service sector-led recession, and we don't have one of those to go back and look at and say, this is what happened last time. So we are a bit off the landscape, so I'm going to put that out there for our framework and how we're navigating through things. Um, one of the things, indicators we've been looking at, I would encourage everyone here to look at, to the next slide, um, has been initial and continuing claims for unemployment. I mean, prior to this, you were dealing with about a six to 800,000 weekly claim of, of unemployment being the highest total ever. And we basically did two or three weeks of six to seven million claims. Unheard of amounts of claims. Again, back to policy driven recession. Um, the big thing we're focused on now is the area chart, the blue in the background. And these are the number of people that are continuing to receive unemployment insurance. 
And the biggest thing we've noted here is that about the second week of May, and we're going to come back to the second week of May later in the conversation, um, the momentum shifted. The economy stopped contracting from an economic impact standpoint, and we began to start having some recovery. It's a very slow recovery, as you can see by that slope there, but we're no longer contracting the economy, per se, from an employment standpoint. Now, where do we go from here? What's going to be the speed and shape? And if you flip the next slide, these are kind of the three outlooks we've been kind of playing with. We've been looking at a lot of different folks out there. We work a good bit with IHS, um, but we've kind of been settling in on it as a company, sort of looking at an optimistic uh, baseline, pessimistic base, pessimistic number, and then a baseline number. Basically, if I go back to my three points, we're pretty much at best on the green line from a control of the virus standpoint. Um, we're pretty much, we were starting out somewhere between blue and green because not all that fiscal monetary policy exactly went where it was supposed to go, but we did get a lot of money out. That was good. Um, but we're probably trending toward the green line again at best in terms of going forward. Um, so far, we seem to be saying with the pessimistic case. Um, but most of these you can see are basically pointing to we don't get back to pre-recession levels or pre-pandemic levels of economic activity till 20, uh, late 2021, early 2022. It's basically a 5 to 7% contraction in GDP this year. Compare that to 2008-9 where you were doing more like a 5% annualized contraction in GDP. So this is sharp. It is deep. And we are really mixing things up. The question mark is right now we've been trying to figure out how do we track this because so many of our normal trackers are off. And that's where we've actually spent a little time looking at our own data internally. So let me switch over to the summing company perspective. You'll flip to the next slide here. Basically, so we started working at home March 13th, and that next week we started going, okay, we first of all we've got to figure out what are we looking at. So we started reading everything we could. I mean, it's kind of funny to me, the vendor we work with basically I think revised their March forecast at least three times during the month of March. Um, but we kind of settled in and developed a couple of ranges and basically we kind of came into the electricity sales would probably decline two and a half to five percent. To put that in perspective, and we basically saw about a four and a half percent decline in electricity sales during the last recession. Put it in another perspective that's very different is in the 2001 recession, 2008-9, we saw an 11 and a half percent decline in industrial sales and almost no change in com commercial or residential energy demand. And again, I come back to Think about when you think about energy demand and economic activity. You can't have economic activity without energy consumption and vice versa. We can't have energy consumption without economic activity. So they're good proxies for each other. Um, so as we started thinking about this, we came back with this 2.5%, 5% decline, or basically for our company, about a $250 million to $400 million impact on re non-fuel revenues. And if we put it together, and this is what we just released in our last earnings call, this graph here on the uh, left um, is kind of what we were expecting in the second quarter. And the good news is from a total retail sales perspective, we talk about residential, commercial, industrial sales, we were pretty close. I mean, I call that within horseshoes and hand grenade distance between the stripe line, which was our projection of what we thought we'd see in the second quarter, and the solid bar there of what we actually got. It's basically about an 8% decline in retail sales. We thought we would get more commercial sales contraction than industrial sales, and it actually turned out to be a little different, but we still got large contractions in commercial business activity and industrial business activity. The one that was kind of, we were expecting, we were expecting residential to be up because if everybody's working at home, guess what? You're all wanting to be comfortable in your home, right? So you're turning the AC or messing with the AC. You're opening, you're cooking stuff on your stove. You're using that a whole lot more. And to the chagrin of many of us, we're opening that refrigerator a whole lot more during all this. Um, so energy is up in the residential class and it's up about what we had expected it to be. 
here. Uh, now that's been sort of waxing and waning. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. But overall, we're still feeling pretty confident about the projection we did back in April, early April, of again, a five to seven percent decline in GDP resulting in about a two and a half to five percent decline in electricity usage across the Southeast, which is pretty similar to what other utilities are seeing around the US. Some are seeing more where there was more restrictions on business activity, uh, very few are seeing less. But the bottom line is, and you see here, and it's my sort of theme for the day, huge uncertainty about where we go the second half of the year here. Uh, let's change over to the next slide here. Um, Jessica, if you switch to the next slide. Or maybe not. Is it not advancing in your view? I've moved two, two yeah. slides forward. Okay. I'm going to do this. It didn't advance in my view, but yeah, I think that's giving me a problem. I said I'm still connected um, the other way. I just need to remember where I'm at, and I'll be right there. I'm just going to pull up my manual copy. <laughs> Could it be on, I thought it was doing. So right now I'm on slide seven. Improving trends. Uh, improving trends in demand, but uncertainty remains. Okay, hang on one second here. I'm going to type a password because my computer is, of course, wanting a password right in the middle of a presentation. <laughs> Welcome, folks, to the Zoom world. Uh, but um, okay, there we go. Um, boom. All right, now, no, right. so yeah, slide seven, which is the improving trends in demand. So. This is also why I dial into my phone separately from the video screen. <laughs> um, there we go. I see it on your end now, too. Um, one of the things we did is we actually started creating several tools to figure out what is going on out there. And one of the things, we basically run a pool for electricity in the southeast. So everything from Mississippi to Alabama to Georgia, the Panhandle of Florida, all the municipals, all the co electric cooperatives, uh, we basically dispatch the electric generating units on an economic basis in that. The good news on that is we have basically hourly data on how much electricity is being consumed in the Southeast. And so we actually took that and looked at daily energy, because daily energy is a little more stable than hourly energy usage. Um, and we built a model pre-pandemic for the past two years. So we did 2018 to 2020 early and said, okay, what are the load trends that are going on as a function of temperature? And then gave that model actual temperatures to see what its prediction of what, of what load should be. And we compared that to actual conditions. And that's what you're seeing in front of you in this graph. So you see the zero line up there. The zero line, if there was no impact of the pandemic on electricity usage, you should see no colorful bars down there. Unfortunately, you see colorful bars, blue, orange, green, yellow, and not so colorful gray, um, representing the seven day moving averages of our daily impacts of energy of the pandemic on energy usage. And what we see is the economic impact started about mid-May, really late, not May, May excuse me, mid-March, uh, started ramping up, sort of peaked out about the second week of April, sort of stayed at that high level in that second week of April into the second week of May. Remember I mentioned the second week of May earlier. Pretty much as we started reopening up the economy, removing the restrictions on the economy, we saw a very rapid increase or decrease here in the impacts of the pandemic on energy usage. And we've seen continued improvement through June and into July. Now you may kind of go, wait a minute, you're showing there's no impact of the pandemic on the economy as you get to late July. Um, that's not quite true. This is a net number. It includes residential, commercial, and industrial. And remember I said we're seeing some upside impacts of residential usage. Uh, and that's what we started seeing here in late uh, July is residential increased energy usage is offsetting the continued impacts we're seeing in the commercial and industrial sector. 
But overall, it, it's a very picture, very consistent with the continuing claims for unemployment insurance of an economy that shut down very rapidly, stayed down for pretty much a full month, and didn't really start recovering until we get to about the second week of May. If you flip to the next slide, we'll talk a little more about what we're seeing in the residential marketplace with consumers. And here, we basically, same kind of modeling framework, we built a pre-pandemic model, projected it out, and um, compared it to actual conditions. And what we saw is, again, as soon as everybody started working at home, we basically saw about mid-March increased residential usage. There's some temperature relationships in there. Again, more warm bodies in the home means you need more air conditioning load. But the flip side is when it gets a little cooler, and then you see temperature is represented on this by the blue dotted lines, um, more warm bodies means you don't need as much heat. So um, we've had some variation in the residential impact, but pretty consistently, while the shelter in place orders were in place, we were seeing increased usage. And then in May, we removed the shelter in place orders, and everybody went screening from their homes, it was what it kind of looks like here on the graph. Um, and energy usage was below expectations, and then kind of settled back to within expectations, especially from a statistical standpoint, uh, for the rest of the month of May into June into early July. Can well, I, we're sort of scratching our, yeah. Could I interrupt you for a Go moment? I, on my end, I think you cut out. You started talking about the blue dotted line. Um, I don't know if that happened for all of our attendees, but could I ask you to rewind sure. slightly and reca recap that point? Yeah, no problem. So uh, I think on the blue, I was talking about there's a temperature relationship here. And so we basically did see um, more people in the home and it gets warmer outside, you need more cooling energy. But with more people in the home um, and it's cooler outside, you don't need, need as much heat. So there was some temperature relationship. But overall, once we get to May into June, um, residential usage settled back into normal what we're scratching our head about here as we get to July, is we see as average daily temperatures got above 80 degrees outside. We've seen this residential uplift occurring again, and it's continuing into August. Now, part of that may be we know occupancy is higher in the homes right now, but it also may be with it getting warmer, more people staying inside. This also corresponds well to the second wave of the COVID impact, and so are more people deciding to not go out as much as we get here into late July and early August. Jessica, does that hold together better on a sound quality standpoint? Yes, and I'm, I'm getting feedback from the other board members that it was mine that cut out, not yours, so I apologize for the interruption. That's okay, no problem. <laughs> I just emphasized that point really well. Uh, so we'll Thank switch you. to the next slide. Let's, let's talk about commercial a little bit. Uh, a little bit different format, but some, same modeling principle here, uh, where we did a pre-pandemic modeling, we looked at different segments. Uh, these segments here represent about 80% of the commercial energy usage, and they're kind of roughly in size order, where office buildings use about 25% of the energy in the commercial class. Um, and what you can see is the remote working has an impact. Pretty much consistently, April, May, June, we've had 10% less energy usage than we should be having based on pre-pandemic trends. And if we had gone into July, no movement in July, August, we saw a little bit of improvement. One of the things we did find interesting as we look at the data, the big office buildings are staying down. Smaller office buildings, however, are actually seeming to recover and getting close to back to normal again. But we're seeing some continued just big down. And that makes sense. I mean, Southern Company, we're not going to be back in the office no time this year, and they'll reevaluate it again at the end, at the beginning of the year next year. Um, and as I tell folks, I had the wonderful joy when I did actually have to go into the office one day about a week ago of driving the speed limit on 75, 85 at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I'll never get to do that again in my entire life, but it was kind of interesting. Um, categories I'll point out to you that have seen nice recovery and have continued to recover into um, July and August is retail. That's your big box stores, gross, uh, big box stores, um, all your retail chains. Um, restaurants, restaurants have been the most recovered. 
Hotels have started to recover too, but again, in hotels, we've seen some dichotomy between big hotels and small hotels, with bigger hotels seeing more impacts. Restaurants are the one, if you actually will look at this individual data, we can see where restaurants about the second week of April begin to figure out how to do takeout. And restaurants go from the most impacted segment out there to the least impacted out of these three categories here over the time period. And currently restaurants are down about seven, yeah, about seven percent right now. Um, so doing very, very well in terms of impact. And that's what's happening right now. Businesses are figuring out how to get work done and figuring out how to get differently. And what's interesting here is a couple things that are going on, how we're teaching customers to do things differently. Um, I went into Target during all this and talked to one of the um, sales clerks and I asked how's business and I'm like well kind of quiet in here but we're saying really busy loading up the carts and people do the digital equivalent of honking the horn by clicking their phone and we carry their goods out to their car and when I talk to people they like that we are teaching people how to do differently and one of the big things we're seeing is, is that businesses that were well positioned to take advantage of the digitization trends and e-commerce trends have been able to really power through what's been going on here. And you see it in the retail sales data in the second quarter. 8% decline in retail sales in the second quarter. E-commerce increases 25%. And with, you know, just to further exacerbate trends going on here, the energy usage, we know there's a lot of large retail chains that are you know, declaring bankruptcy. And there was an article the other day talking about Amazon is looking at taking over some of those locations like JCPenney's for local warehouse space. There's a change going on, and if you read the trade press, pretty much all the retail train trends that were going on, again, these small trickles prior, have been accelerated two to three years. And how this continues to go forward and what that means, both from an energy standpoint and economic activity standpoint, is going to be very interesting as we go forward. If you jump over to the industrial sales to show you a little bit what we're seeing in the industrial economy, um, basically, it was interesting here. In 2008-9, everybody was down. It was just across the board. Here, a lot of impacts in the transportation sector, auto manufacturing. And it was interesting, not because they were having COVID outbreaks on the production line, it was because the workers couldn't come to work because they had children at home and all their daycare options had gone away. So think about that. You cannot get economic activity done because your workers can't get to work because they have other family obligations. Huge issue. And what does that change? How does that change? cause labor to think differently about how they work? How does it cause businesses to think about what they need to provide for their workers to be successful? So with auto production being down, um, primary metals, steel, follows that very, very closely. Um, I will say paper here kind of will throw you off a little bit. These are actually a little different modeling. This is just year over year comparison. Um, in the paper segment, personal products, toilet paper and paper towels are up, running full capacity, despite what you see in your grocery store shelves. But basically there was a consequence to everyone buying out all the toilet paper. Um, the other one is the e-commerce trend I mentioned brown paper, brown paper boxes, pumping out as many boxes as they can. Um, what is down, one of the pre-COVID uh, impact here in Georgia, Resolute, which manufactured newsprint over in Augusta, closed permanently in December. They were a large energy user. Uh, and number two, uh, this is a COVID impact. A white paper manufacturer that we serve basically has shut down for a period of time because with all of us not being in the office and not all of us not being in school, you don't need as much white paper. And the question mark is now that we're forced to, are we truly going to get that paperless office that we've been talking about for years and years and years because we're not in the office to print everything out anymore? Um, chemicals, other than supply chain problems, and there's a few supply chain problems running through those categories, but lumber continues very strong as the housing and construction industry seem to be continuing very strong. Stone clay and glass has had a little weakness as um, the state and the municipal budgets have been reduced a little bit through all of this, which is reducing highway budgets. 
So some impacts going on in that category. But overall, as you can see the trend there, a manufacturing economy that is recovering. And we saw these continued recoveries into the month of July. So a lot of information here. If you have questions about it, we'd be glad to go into any more detail. One more slide here, we'll, and then we'll stop and take questions. This is kind of, kind of the last thing, and we can go into more detail in any of these, which I would like to go into here. But I, we've been really spending a lot of our time starting to think about, okay, that's all the data we just went through. But what's going to shape that data? What are going to be the longer trends that are going on out there? And kind of coming back to our framework that we originally started with, what's the spread of the virus? And I kind of use this more sort of shocking thing, vaccine warfare. It's actually from an article in Politico a couple of months ago. Um, just sort of pointing out the fact that, think about it, the countries that get the vaccine first are not only the vaccine, but an effective treatment or an effective technology to create vaccines in response to future pandemics has a huge economic advantage. How do they use that economic advantage? Who do they share it with? Their allies? Do they share it with everyone? A real opportunity for political gamesmanship, for diplomatic gamesmanship around not only the vaccine itself, but the technology that produces it. And then what industries come out of the technologies that are able to rapidly produce a vaccine or effective treatment out there. Just something to think about, but to me, all these other trends that we're thinking about hinge on how long before we have something. Um, that is just something we're really focusing on, keeping an eye on. Um, the impact on productivity in our economy is just really, really huge here. Um, the other thing, and I could add a whole bunch on this economic shift thing, I've highlighted a few, but a couple to think about, and I've seen the pundits talking about, oh, nobody's gonna live in the city anymore. They're all gonna wanna live in the country. I think until they want their Starbucks. Um, but um, I do think it's a real question of what does this do not only to the speed of urban growth, but what is the nature of urban growth? Does it change how we build things? Types of homes, I've been kind of laughing a little bit, I have several new employees that joined our team in the past couple of years and they all got their brand new spanking apartment in downtown Atlanta. As a matter of fact, we saw multifamily apartment or, or multifamily homes grow about 10% in terms of their share, single family versus multifamily, over the past decade. But it was a great living in a 600 square feet apartment pre-pandemic because, hey, I'm working all day, I'm out on the weekends enjoying Pont City Market and all these other great amenities of living in the city. But now I'm sitting in a 600 square feet apartment working every single day, looking at that same wall of that 600 square feet apartment. It's changing some people's minds about what they want in terms of where they want to live. The longer this goes on, it may be called patterns. And we're seeing a big shift in capital spending. Spending that's being required to now keep employees safe, but also thinking about you know where do you invest your monies out there? Um, and you know the new facilities. Interesting thing is we're seeing a lot of businesses still very interested in economic development here in the southeast. Um, it is the uncertainty of the environment is slowing some decision making, but the demand for economic development here is still staying pretty high. Um, if you flip over then to a teleworking, I mean, as I tell folks, last week we did a webinar in the office and had to put on work clothes for the first time since March 13th. I had to wear dress shoes for the first time. So I am voting for teleworking as a continuing trend. Um, but um, what does teleworking do to things out there? Do clothing stores, to office demand? As we talked to one company that's building a headquarters here in Atlanta, they were kind of going like, well, we thought about it. We may change how we're laying out those offices, and they may be a little further apart, and we may have more remote working, but the combination of those two trends means we still need about the same amount of office. Will that be true for everyone? If you saw the Wall Street Journal today, Amazon did, came out and said, hey, we think we still need office space because collaboration is important, and it doesn't get all that. 
some of the other big tech companies saying you can work in Heyhara and still work for Facebook. So those are the question marks of what happens there, probably still very uncertain trend. Data centers, we're seeing, I mean, think about this. Could we actually have the economy function as well as it did 15 years ago? And I think the answer is no. Data centers become a huge thing, both from a teleworking standpoint and just an e-commerce standpoint. Um, regulation, again, it's election season, but I just think about what have voters been through so far? Not being able to work because I didn't have child care, not being able to get health coverage because I don't have health coverage provided to me. What things do voters demand and how do legislators uh, respond to that challenge out there? A lot of uncertainty in a season of uncertainty right now. Another one I'll kind of wrap up with, we're kind of looking at is resiliency demand. The Southern Company, we've talked about it a little bit, and you know, I kind of go back to my original theme of so goes the economy, so goes the demand for energy, but also so goes energy, so goes the economy. And we understand how important it is to make sure we're providing a resilient service uh, for energy to make sure the economy is functioning and running. So we're very concerned watching that. We've been doing a lot internally to make sure we keep our employees healthy and safe, able to respond to storms, and um, been doing well with that. But from a business perspective, how do you think about your supply chain? We surveyed our national account customers, which are large chain customers, and about 80 to 90 percent of them had some impact on their supply chain. Do you need to geographically diversify? Do you make sure your data centers have energy in a more resilient manner to them? Do you basically, the other interesting thing we're looking at on electrification is, is a lot of the businesses, and I remember we talked about you know, Target or other big box stores out there, are basically doing local deliveries of goods and services, but they also want to make sure they're hitting their sustainability goals. And so they're looking more and more at, hey, I don't want to have a bunch of internal combustion engines delivering goods and services. I want to be looking at electric vehicles doing that. So the question mark is, how do we make sure the supply and service to those electric vehicles is resilient? So a lot of questions out there on that. At the end of the day, when we look at all these trends, I kind of keep looking at them, which ones are going to be a short term, which ones are going to be long term. And from our perspective, it's really which ones actually bring the productivity improvements. Those that bring productivity improvements will be here for us. And the thing right now is we're going through is we've got a real world business case to go test out a lot of new ideas, see which ones work, see which ones don't work and see how things change. Now, as I come back to sort of my item three that I started all this with, we think in terms of what gets adopted, what doesn't get adopted is really going to shape how fast we recover from this and then how resilient we are in the future to future shocks and changes. So I'll stop there, Jessica, and see what questions we've pulled up. That sounds great. So I will keep your screen, um, your slides up just in case there's questions about the slides and I'll thumb back and forth. But um, let me say thank you, Kenneth, for your presentation. Um, at the Fed, we do lots of economic updates, but it's not often through the lens of the utilities. So I, I thought your presentation was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to throw a little bit of a wrench. I'm going to pivot to Daniel. He's going to man the Q&A. I didn't want to disrupt the presentation flipping back and forth. So um, Daniel. Do you want to pose questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Kenneth, we have about four questions. So I'll kind of start with a more labor market oriented one and then probably trickle down to uh, next one's more consumer behavior wise. And then the uh, last two are more oriented towards the virus and some long term projections. Um, so I'll throw you the first one that was in the chat. This is regarding labor market shortages, and the question goes, staffing agencies are seeing a significant shortage of labor, specifically in the warehousing and manufacturing sectors. Um, and the question stems is, you know, any idea what's causing this? Um, perhaps maybe a lack of childcare or maybe the incentive of the $600 per week of federal unemployment benefits that are keeping some people on the sidelines. This, is, this was all part of the question, Kenneth. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think a couple things to think about here. One, I think um, 
we're having a shift in the economy. I mean, you think about this. How many times do you have start a recession and large major corporations are announcing that they're hiring hundreds of thousands of people? And that's what we had with some of the e-commerce retailers out there. I think the, the thing we're dealing with is, is the natural transition. You look in past recessions, we've had industrial shifts. In other words, all of a sudden, hey, my industrial job went away, so I have to go work for another manufacturer, or I've got to go move to the service economy. We've not really had a service sector shock, and I think everybody's been kind of going, well, wait, let me wait, see if that job comes back. I've got a little cushion here, maybe potentially with that $600. Um, but now, as you're starting to get to the other side of this, is that where's the job growth at? Where is it not at? And I think you'll probably have more and more people entering back into the labor force as you go forward, but it's a pretty big shock. You don't get things happening quickly when it's very brand new. And I think that's what we're going through right now. Um, I will kind of come back to our teleworking trend. It's an interesting thing. And some of the studies I've been looking at, I try to look at pre-pandemic studies because um, some of the post-pandemic studies about productivity and other things get a little hyped up. But this is a pre-pandemic study that sort of looked at remote working. And they basically came back and said, if you look at all the talent that you could access. I mean, basically somebody had to go live in Hey Hire because that's where their parents are at. They may have a great degree in some field out there, but they need to stay and take care of their parents. If you could access that talent through remote working and do that nationwide, their estimate is it's a 10% increase to the labor supply. So think about what we were dealing with prior to this recession. We were at three and a half percent unemployment. Imagine if we could actually say, now be more comfortable with remote working and having developed the appropriate tools to employ in remote working and knowing which jobs work, we could grow the labor supply by 10%. That's a huge productivity savings and a huge boost to the economy. And I think these things like the shortages and demand here in the temporary services area are going to push that thing of causing businesses to think about where do I get my talent and do I really need to see Jimmy every single day? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kenneth. And the next one is more in the lines of shifts in consumer consumer behavior. You touched on you recently had to go back to the office and put on a suit for the first time and maybe the last couple months. So the question entails to what extent will the decrease in business travel be a permanent shift down uh to the economy? And it's a two part question. The second part is uh, is leisure and hospitality, uh, including travel, would, would that likely be a, would it, would it likely lag and drag the economy down? I, you know, unfortunately, I think the answer is yes. Um, a couple of reasons. One, um, you would go, use 9-11 as a model. It was two and a half years after 9-11 for air travel reached pre-9-11 levels. I think you're at least looking at that for this situation. But number two, again, is you're forcing people to do business differently. And I've seen it, and uh, Roger Tutter of Kennesaw State kind of has seen the same trend. I'm talking to friends of ours that are professional salespeople that go out and hit the roads with their road warriors. They're, you know, talking to customers and generating business and all. And, you know, they're some of the ones that were just complaining the most when they couldn't travel anymore. Until they realize that Zoom, they can actually get more work done because they're not sitting around wasting time in the airport. And go back to my theme, what trends stick? Productivity sticks. And if people can make more money by being on the road, not, not being on the road, excuse me, then I think you're going to see a shift there and it'll be probably a, at least a much more selective travel engagement going forward. And using more of the technology. Everybody has learned how to use Zoom or Blue Jeans or Teams or as we were having to suffer through Skype. Um, but um, we are teaching people how to get work done differently. And I think this is a category where it's going to stick. I saw a good article of the day was sort of pointing, this is talking to professional travel planners. Their inside industry estimate is that there's probably a 10 to 15 percent permanent reduction in business travel going forward. Um, and the reason why is it's going to be more productive because we have the tools now to do it. 
uh, that we didn't have 15 years ago. Did I get all the parts of the question? Yep, you did. Thanks, Kenneth. And we, we have a couple more just, just trickled in. So we have about four yeah. more. I know we have about nine minutes left. So I'll, I'll shift over a bit. And there's actually one that you might like to answer um, as it pertains to some of the work we've been doing recently. And it's, it's related to electric vehicles. So, or yeah. the electrific electrification of fleets. So the, the question is, can you speak a bit more about the forecast of the electrification of the motor vehicle fleet in the post pandemic period? Yeah, it's kind of interesting a little bit. So we've been working not only just with consumers, but we've been working a lot with businesses because a lot of the business customers we work with, matter of fact, if you look at last time we did this survey about the top 40 of our 50, 40 of our top 50 customers, let me say it that way, um, have some sort of pretty concrete sustainability energy efficiency goal out there. At Southern Company, we've committed to being a net zero carbon emitter by 2050 having a 50% reduction in our carbon emissions by 2030. We feel very confident that 2030 goal, we're going to have to have some technology push to get to the 2050 goal, but everybody's pushing to a more sustainable future. In electric vehicles, especially as we clean up the grid, which we are already doing, that's what I point to. Today, we are about 70%, 70, 10 years ago, about 70% of our energy came from coal, Today, that's less than 25%. I've had close to 20% this year. Um, the grid's getting cleaner. So that's the long-term trend. However, short-term, what we're seeing is that the pandemic has disrupted some of the R&D and technology advancements. And I think, you know, Rivian is one that had to push out some of their delivery dates a little bit. Um, but the trend overall long-term is Electricity is a cleaner fuel for powering transportation. Uh, and it's one that's here to stay, we believe, in the long term. As a matter of fact, a lot of these shifts to more like local delivery made us accelerate those trends more in the business marketplace for transportation than the personal consumer marketplace. But overall, most of the trends keep pointing to about a 2025 crossover point in terms of the uh, economics between internal combustion engines and uh, electric vehicles. Perfect. Good answer there, Kenneth. You answered another question that I think you, you touched on there. Uh, it was relating to, to emissions, uh, which yep. I think you touched on that answer. So I'll, I'll move over to switching over back to, to more of the, uh, the economy part that you talked about with fiscal response. And uh, the question is, Let's see if I get the right one here. What are your long-term concerns about our nation's fiscal policy response to the virus? Uh, for example, a deficit, a deficit in spending. Yeah. Well, this is always the question that comes up when you have recessions and some respects, I would say recessions are not exactly the time you need to be worrying about deficits. You do need to be worrying about deficits though when your economy is stronger. You need to be building your war chest for when things are not strong like they are right now. I think longer term is, is a concern. I think no doubt about it. When you add this much to the deficit, you're, you know, you, what are you doing when you do deficit spending? You're basically borrowing from the future, which means you're basically requiring more tax revenues to be collected in the future to pay for buffering the harm that was happening currently. It's much better to bust the harm in the short term and borrow in the future, but you have to keep those two policy responses in check. So, I mean, I think really unfortunately, you know, closet on the fortunate side, we're in much better shape than a lot of our peers. Now, we may be soaring among turkeys, but if you look at Europe, you look at Japan, you look at China, and where they're at, where their deficit is a point of GDP versus where we're at. Again, we're not in a great place, but we're better than they are. The question mark is, how can we come out of this on the other side and start building our war chest for us going forward to keep things balanced out? Um, but I think bottom line is, I think we all need to expect taxes will be future, higher in the future unless we figure out some more efficient way to grow the economy faster, which it's probably not a, not a lot of good ways to grow it faster unless technology really takes off. That's right. 
And one more question here. I guess we can wrap up after this one. When do you think will when do you think there will be a, a widely used vaccine available for the virus? Um, <laughs> and for example, IHS has talked about maybe mid of next year having a more widely available vaccine. Uh, from things that you have seen and read, uh, what are your predictions on that? On, on when when will we have that? Yeah. Well, I figured everybody on the on the call here today has gotten their plane ticket to Russia to go get the vaccine since they already have it. Um, but um, it kind of goes back to my vaccine warfare comments of just thinking about how important it is to have a vaccine and see what Russia has been doing and other countries trying to sort of jump jump the shark a little bit on vaccines. But yeah, I think realistically, all the research information I've been seeing, I think sometime next year. I think the things that are actually probably more encouraging in the shorter time period is actually effective treatment. And I think if you look at the hospitalization rates and the mortality rates that we're seeing now versus what we saw earlier in the virus, we are figuring out how to treat it better. We're also coming out with other treatments for the virus better. And I think that's probably what I would keep my eye on more in the short term than I would actually vaccine. Vaccines are important. But I think effective antiviral treatments are what's going to be what gives people confidence, not just for this pandemic, but future pandemics uh, going forward. Uh, so that's where we keep kind of keeping our eye on things right now.